Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. And today we're doing some actual relationship saving. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson with my good friend, Pete Wright. And we're going to talk about a bunch of relationships that may be in your life for a short period of time or a very long period of time, depending on how things go in that relationship. It's all about these relationships, Seth. And that's why we we started the show. We had this brainstorm. It's going to be a great title. And we haven't talked about the the breadth of those relationships. But I think it might be a good segue. You had some interest in doing just a little bit of follow-up from last week's show. Let's start by talking about the relationship that is central to this entire experience, and that is the one with your soon-to-be former spouse. Well, I was actually thinking after the show, like, oh, I should have said that, or there was a good point I wanted to make, which, like I told you in a previous show, I hate it when I have those thoughts walking back from the courthouse after the hearing. Like, I should have said that in court. That's never what you want to do, but I always play it over my head. Oh, yeah. So it's a little frustrating, but I think it makes me a better lawyer at the end of the day. So two little points from last week's show about making sure you're doing everything you can to work on your marriage before you decide to go through a dissolution. One is, it takes two. We really talked a lot last week about making sure you're doing everything you can do, everything you can do, everything you can do, but I just didn't want it to get lost that it takes two to make a relationship work. So one thing you might wanna consider doing when you're working on your relationship is do not make demands, just make requests. Like if you're asking your spouse to change a behavior or you're trying to change behaviors or how you guys interact in some way, shape or form, it's just a request. And it makes it very simple. In kind of the balancing act, when you have so many requests that are just not being met and that outweighs all the positive stuff, that might be that kind of aha moment, like this isn't working. Mm -hmm. Now, some requests might just be deal breakers, like, no, I'm not doing that. And that's perfectly acceptable. Everyone gets to set their own boundaries. So just think that you're in it with somebody else. And also, I really wanted to end with this last week. I truly believe, and I've seen this time and time again, that the bravest thing people do is actually stand up for themselves and then move forward. And I am not advocating that you get a divorce, but I've seen people get stuck. And when they finally get the courage to move forward, and then I see them years later, and I just think, how brave is that to say, it's a scary process, there's a lot of unknowns, it's easier to stay where I am and not live my best life, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off that diving board, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna go into that deep end, but at the end of it, even how awful it might be going through it, there is something better after you get through this process. And even standing up and saying, no, I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm going to focus on myself. So I just wanted to quickly put an exclamation point on that um, and recap from last week. And sorry, I didn't do it then, everyone. No, no, no. It's, I, I think that's a great, it's actually, I think, a great way to start this conversation. And I know we're, we're talking in terms of former spouses, but, you know, I, I, I feel like I mean it when I say saving your relationships, right? This, that you never know sort of where your former spouse is going to fit into your life if you don't do the work to stand up, move on. But in some ways, um, you recognize that you're going to be moving on with this person just in a new capacity, right? I mean, you're a terrific example. Well, thank you. I, I mean, my former spouse and I, have, we've talked about get along. I don't say the word X because I feel it's derogatory. And I think that former spouse relationship changes over time and it also depends how much you still have in common. If you don't have children together, if you're not in business together, yeah. and after you go through a divorce, it's probably pretty quickly that you guys are just gonna not be in each other's lives. Yeah. Now, if you're in the same community, if you're in the same business, um, or if you have the same group of friends, then you might see each other from time to time. But, and, and you'll have to navigate that issue like, oh, this is the party we both used to go to. Um, but if you don't have kids, it 
and it's not a very long-term marriage. Usually people go back to doing what they're doing. And it's like, oh yeah, you kind of lose track of them. Of course, social media people start getting blocked and all Mm -hmm. that. And then I have all those other divorces that start because someone found an old girlfriend or boyfriend on Facebook and got reconnected. But when you're going through it in this relationship, you're going to have going forward, depending on what you still have in common, uh, required or otherwise, children, you're obviously going to be dealing with that person for the rest of your life. Now, how often you deal with them gets dramatically less over time as children get older. Sure. When you're dealing with a four-year-old going back and forth, and if you're still in COVID and you're figuring out how to do a first grader on Zoom for school, if they're locked down and not going to brick and mortar school, that's a lot more interaction, organizing it. It gets less and less when the kids get older and they're 16 and they, if they get a car. Sure. Kids, kids are vapor. They're gone. Yeah. Right. When they're in college, your interaction is even less with your former spouse. So the younger they are, the more transitions back and forth between the homes, the more figuring out the holidays, you got to clear stuff, all that Mm -hmm. stuff. It's much more in your face than it is when they're, and when they're 30, you're just hoping you're going to get invited to the wedding and not have to pay for them. That's good. I can see where your head is right now. That's fine. It's fine. I get exactly. it. My kid's 16. I got time. Yeah, right. You got a little time. Well, and, and I think that goes to you know, to what we're talking about. It's just making making space both in your sort of in your head and your heart to to show up to that relationship wherever that may be. Exactly. And have really low expectation. We all get upset when expectations aren't met. Mm-hmm. Whether it's the restaurant you went to, the food wasn't doing, you know, was bad service. Whether you're at a stoplight, the light turns green, the car in front of you doesn't go, and whatever your expectation is, you get upset. You get frustrated. You get annoyed. You honk your horn. Maybe you don't honk your horn. So lower your expectation. If your former spouse is a total pain, and every time they deal with you, they're a total pain, you should just expect they're going to be a total pain. It's just going to be water off a duck's back. Anything they're going to say, I've heard it before. Like, come up with some new material, mm-hmm, man. Mm-hmm. Like, and just move on. And and don't let their behavior control how you respond. You have a choice on how you respond. And one way to do that is just lower your expectation. Okay. All right. So now let's let's run through a list of the common former spousal relationships. And just look, and I, I think what I'm looking for from you is... An, an, uh, maybe an exploration of best practices where you've seen these relationships really thrive or flourish. Uh, or maybe, I guess, if they really, really haven't, that would be okay too. Okay, so hit me with a, hit me with a relationship and we'll just go through it. Well, okay, let's start with the, uh, the multiple former spouses. So either you are a first former spouse or you're one of many or you have one of many. Okay. So you're going to have a different relationship potentially with each of those former spouses, but then those former spouses may or may not have relationships, <sighs> which just complicates things. Does that make you just maybe at some point you should just think maybe I should just not get married? It's too... It... Leading cause of divorce is marriage. We've covered this, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the deal with this, yeah. it's all about interpersonal skills, right? So... Some people might have different relationship with different former spouses, but those kids, if there were kids involved, then the kids might be like half siblings, Mm -hmm. right? And the kids might have just step siblings that were step siblings. And now you get divorced and they're not step siblings. They're just suddenly nothing. There's no ex step sibling. Right. Right. There's no, there, there, no ex step sibling. No one ever says that's my ex step sibling. That just doesn't roll off the tongue. Right. Right. So for you, it's just managing how you want to be in those relationships, knowing that there are also other things that happen because maybe for a long time, this was a step parent to a child and now you get divorced and then, okay, what do you do about the stepchild that you're no longer a step parent to, right? That's another one. What? So what do you do about that? Let's, uh, let's get it. Let's look at the kids. So. That is totally based upon your relationship with that child and that child's relationship with you. 
and then how that child navigates whether parents want you to be involved or not. And under the law, no rights. Okay. I was married. My former spouse had a child previously. That was my stepdaughter. We get divorced. I have no rights to her. And and she and she has no rights or expectations to you either. It's not like she's going to come well, to you and say, "Well, she might have expectations, come, but, but no maybe rights. no rights." Like, you know, you're right. not responsible for her pay for college, that kind of a thing. Exactly. So, actually, people will ask me, "Well, Seth, how many children do you have?" Do you think that would be an easy question for me to answer? It's really tricky. It is for me, yeah, because I say it this way: I have four children in my heart, one biological one former step, and my girlfriend has two children. So I love four kids. I only have to pay for half a college for one. And thankful to all humanity, my DNA is only passed on to one. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a long answer, but it gets me back, takes me back. I went to high school with a, a, a woman who said, who referred to her mom as her egg mom because she has an egg mom and she has a mom. She was not close to her egg mom. But her stepmom, she refers to as her mom. And everybody has these different names. For example, my son has a stepfather. And when we're out and about, he says, oh, that's my stepdad. Yeah. Okay. In our family, especially when he was younger now, when he was younger, not so much now, we just call him Steve because that's his name. Yeah, right. But we called him bonus dad. Bonus dad. Yeah. He was the icing on the cake. He was the cherry on top. Wow. That's what we would call him. That's yep. better. He's that is better than dad. Steve the extra dad. Or yeah. <laughs> Steve, I'm just hanging yeah. around here. Steve right. the, the appendix dad. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh man, Steve, I'm getting in trouble now. Steve, if you're listening, stop, we stop, say this Steve. with love because we know you know how to take it. How about that? Well, Steve actually is the bonus dad because he and my former spouse started a business called Whatever Pops. And it's gourmet popsicles, acai oh. bowls. It is and um, amazing grilled cheese sandwiches. It's so good. So that's definitely the bonus there. Oh, such a bonus, Dad. Steve. So Steve, if you think about this, Steve is now the stepfather to my former stepdaughter. The stepfather to your former stepdaughter. She's just changed. She's yep, like an exchange, yo, Dad. Uh, she oh. she upgraded. She upgraded. <laughs> No, but, and, and look, my former stepdaughter it listens to this podcast, so I know she's going to be hearing all this. I hope she's not cringing, and she already knows what I'm about to say, but she's got me wrapped around her finger. Yeah. If she needs anything, she doesn't, she doesn't ask. She's not greedy in any way, but I am pretty quick with the credit card. <laughs> um, <laughs> because so. now she gets popsicles, and she used to just get, what, briefs? Like, no, you kind of yeah, got, this is knows. payback, right? Now. She's older now. She's <laughs> like graduating college. She's doing her thing. She's, she's amazing. That's fantastic. But our relationship, I didn't see her for many years, yeah. not because of anything was wrong, but she was living her life going back and yeah. forth. And I would, you know, see her at some events, but, um, you know, my son and I love to cook, as you know, yeah. so sometimes we'll be cooking and it will be a recipe that she gave Kai and we'll call her up and it's just great. And when she's in town, I get to see her from time to time. And she's living her life like any like young, any ad young, young adult, yeah. young adult should be doing. Oh, so fantastic. but that's just now there's other friends of mine that have step kids that get divorced, never see them again. Yeah, they weren't that close with them. The relationship with the former spouse was terrible. It just doesn't work. Yeah. OK, uh, what about when. OK, the, the whole relationship with grandparents. How do you how do you manage and save relationship with grandparents through parents, step parents and kids? My parents have never told me this. So this is an assumption that I'm making. I'm pretty solid on this, though. I think they were just devastated when I was getting a divorce. Yeah, they love to this day my former spouse. Yeah. I think it was hard for them, especially if they're talking to their peer group. In those, that peer group who has adult children, if they're not going through a divorce, they're like, well, what, what do you mean you don't get to see Kai on Hanukkah? <laughs> like, well, yeah. he might be at his mom's, right? Yeah. So different jurisdictions have different laws on this, but it's pretty tough around the country for grandparents to have rights to children. And if they do have rights, unfortunately, it means something's really 
going poorly with the child in that life, right? Okay. Like there's dependency issues, there's drug addiction issues, and then the grandparents kind of step in. That's where there's some level of you might be able to get rights, not through divorce, but through what's called dependency. And those rights are are like parental rights, right? They're taking care of the kids. Exactly. But it's very limited in, in at least in Florida, on grandparent rights. Yeah. There's no, there's no custody. There's no like timeshare with grandma and grandpa. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Which think about like, okay, now that my child's with me and I'm sure my parents would, they, they know this, but they also, also understand it. I was very protective of my time with Kai because if I only have him every other weekend and all the other grandkids are going over to my, my parents for a sleepover. It's not that I didn't want him to go and have fun with his cousins. No. But that was just time I was going to miss. Sure. And I'm already missing every other weekend. So it was really hard for me, as my girlfriend would say, the helicopter parent who still is yet to cut the umbilical cord. You <laughs> There's know, a lot of I metaphor mean, in there. It all ends up kind of gross. I know, she just gets it all spinning yeah. <laughs> around. But So it's just hard. And I think grandparents need to, or it'd be helpful to their children to understand that. Yeah. And my parents were absolutely wonderful, never pressured me to do any of that. They got it, but I know that they've kind of missed out, and I do feel badly about that situation that they had no control over. They're yeah. just grandparents who want to see the kid. Right, right. What, it, there's a common trope in, you know, my favorite pastime, movies and television. When you talk about divorce, you talk about who gets the friends. And this is one, you know, we've we've talked about families uh, on the show before in some capacity, but I don't think we've ever really waded into the waters of social groups? I think, in my experiences, in going through a divorce, you really find out who your true friends are. What does that look like? If they're there to support you, and this is the battle with every friend, okay? And I've had this conversation with friends of mine where they've asked me about, oh, what do you think about my girlfriend, you know, I'm thinking about marrying her. And I'm like, do you want the supportive answer that I'm supposed to give if she makes you happy and you think it's great? Yeah. Or do you want to know what I really think, which might be the supportive answer? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I want what you really think. And I'm like, run. She's not the one for you. Run. Yeah. Now, if you get married to her, I'm just telling you, I hope it works out. But from what I see and the information I have, you need to run. This is not going to end well. So do they support you in? You know, you don't want the ones just to bash him right. or bash her and say she's terrible, terrible, terrible. It's like you want a friend that's going to be. How can we get through this? How can I help you get through this? Because that's the that's the the perennial struggle, right? If you're a, if you're the friend of the person marrying somebody who is just, you know, obviously not a great fit, are you being a good friend by saying it or not? I come down on tell them what you really think because they ask. Yeah. And there, there's like cards now that you can get for getting divorced. That's it. Congratulations. We never really liked them. <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> right. There's no I told you so because they never tell you. Yeah, right. Right. And I'm not saying that it's the bad person or it's just not the right fit. Yeah. But I think that's happens when you are going through a divorce, that finding your true friends that are going to support you. OK, yeah, that doesn't mean they're going to bash them all the time. That doesn't mean they're going to agree with you all the time. That doesn't mean they're going to let you always talk about their divorce to you or your divorce to them. You still have to ask them how their day is and what's going on in their life, because you don't want to be that friend where it's like, oh, my God, we're going to hear about the divorce the whole time. We're just trying to have girls night. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're all here to support you. There's time to grieve in a social group. There's always time to yep. grieve. So I think having friends like that are really important. And I will also tell you, like I say over and over again, see a counselor because mm -hmm. that is someone whose only interest is what is in your best interest in helping you get there. Everybody else has interest, whether it's a biased interest, they don't even know about it, but every relationship, everyone has an interest in. But in a counseling setting, that person is there for you and only you. Right. Their interest is you. Right. All right. 
What other relationships can we tackle when you get divorced? Well, and that's a that's a great question. Are there other relationships like who gets the hairdresser? Who gets the See, is that like a joke about my bald head? Is that is that what you were doing <laughs> you there? Know, it's, it was so subtle. It's not a it's actually not a joke. I just didn't know how far afield you wanted to go, but hairdresser happens to be one that uh I have personal experience with. Uh where there was a hair a contested hairdresser. Can we say that? Don't schedule it at the same time. And, you know, now you can no longer confide in that hairdresser. I mean, that's the real problem. Look, look yeah, because two, two, uh, maybe it was last week, you actually uh, instructed us on the the ways of conflicting out uh, an attorney. Right. And that it turns out is is a thing I've that I have seen many times since we talked about this. Like now all I see are Volkswagens, that kind of an experience. Well, this whole experience with conflicting you, these this couple, in fact, they were trying to conflict out the hairdresser, like scheduling so many appointments that the other one couldn't get in. Like it was just they were really trying to to mix up because they both wanted the hairdresser. They needed that hairdresser. They, they need a mediator, which we'll have on later. <laughs> in another show <laughs> about up, how, to, how, bring up the hairdresser. How, how to do a time sharing schedule with a hairdresser. How to split a hairdresser. So here's an interesting relationship that people might not think of if you have kids, stepkids, have a child. I marry someone that has a child. They're now step siblings. And now we get we split up. They were step siblings. Now they are former step siblings. (laughs) Right. Which we we joke about the term. No one ever says that. It gets confusing for them. But. It's all about the relationship that they had. And now with social media, it happens all the time. And I know kids that still will play Xbox with their former step sibling because they can do yeah, that. Right. Right. Now, the parent might just cut them off. Well, that's not necessarily best for the kids. If the kids were getting along, what does it matter? Are they in the same soccer team? Do they go to the same tournaments? Do, were they going to the same school? How does that yeah. happen? So just focus on that because that's really putting them first, not not you first. Well, and that's kind of the lesson I'm getting from this entire sort of assessment of relationships is that uh, there are very few uh, legal relationships, legally defined relationships after a divorce. But there uh, there are a whole bunch of interpersonal relationships, and those can be as warm as you want them. Right. And a lot of that has to deal with how was the relationship when things were going well? And then how did you handle it when that relationship that connected everyone, yours and your spouses, that connected everyone, when that starts going south, how do you handle that to maintain these other relationships? And if those are important to you, it's a little hard to be really nice and try to be nice to a kid when that kid's saying, but you treated my mom like crap. Yeah. So you have to think about that, even when you're scared about where you're going to live and how much money you're going to have and dividing your assets. And I got to get back in the workforce or and I got to deal with my parents who really love my former spouse or soon to be. And you've got a lot of this going on and you're just looking to manage those relationships, which is what we're trying to just help you do and take it one conversation at a time one day at a time. We're not trying to overload you here. But when you're dealing with those people and do things, if you're interested in keeping a positive relationship, you can do things that would you would do whether you were married to their former son or not. Mm-hmm. If you're one that usually would be the one to send the birthday card, send the birthday card. If you know that your former spouse is not going to have your child send a birthday card to grandpa and grandma, even though it's his parents, Send the birthday card. Have the child do it. That's good for your kid. And it just gets you points. Yeah, right. You can always use points. You can always use points. You Think about your uh, clients. Do you ever have any common regrets that you, uh, that you recall people who feel like they mishandled these relationships and wish they'd done something differently? The biggest regret, and this is going to kind of go back to our conversation from last week. The biggest regret that I hear from people is they didn't do it sooner. Mm -hmm. They didn't get a divorce sooner. 
they they held on too long, which is sad to say. And I'm not trying to encourage anyone, but that's the biggest regret that I get. I don't hear a lot about these other relationships. And intuitively, they're just different. Mm -hmm. A step parent, no matter how involved you are and how much that child might love you and how much you love that child, you're not the parent. And that is just a difference. And that goes for step grandparents too. A child will be more upset, usually, if a grandparent passes than a step grandparent, even though that child knows no difference all along the way. Yeah, sure. It's just the psychology of it. So. Let me define a term. So we're in Black's Law Dictionary and we're talking about relationships. This definition in the law is going to sound exactly like it is in English, but there's some things that you should just know about this relationship. The term for today is stepchild. The child of one spouse by a previous relationship. A stepchild is generally not entitled to the same legal rights as a natural or adopted child. A stepchild is not entitled to any intestate rights to a share of a stepparent's estate. English, what does that mean? So the first part's easy. Stepchild is a child from your spouse's previous relationship. We all know that. The next part was generally not entitled to the same legal rights as a natural or adopted child. And then it points to one of those rights. So intestate rights is when someone passes away and they don't have a will. Every state has a statute that says where that person's belongings go if they die and they don't have a will. The great state of Florida, if you're living in Florida and you don't have a will, the great state of Florida has a a will for you. It's in the statute, how your stuff gets divided. A stepchild is not in that statute. It will go to your children. There's parts that will go to your spouse. There's dealing with your house and how that gets all laid out. If it's only in your name and not in your spouse, go meet with an estate and trust lawyer to talk about these things. But when you're getting married to someone with a former, that is a child, and that child's going to become your stepchild, that's a good time to redo your wills and decide whether you want to include that child in your will or not. It's a good time to look at your, what's called an estate plan. That answers so many questions about those like, uh, like knives out. The murder, those murder, like family murder things. Great movie. Yeah. Love that one. Uh, Exactly. Who gets to inherit if you don't have a will? That one, they had a will and might have been changed and all that. Right. Well, yeah, because it was, yeah. All right, right, Seth, working with your lawyer, I know we've spent a lot of time in the first half of our show. Now we're going to dig into the, the major second half, which is your attorney's role in all of these relationships. Uh, where would you like to begin? There's nothing for your divorce lawyer to do. Oh, sad. Hey, look, look at all the money I just saved. People calling their lawyers to talk about what do I do with this stepchild? And, yeah. <laughs> and nothing. time. Nothing. Right. Don't do anything. Now, it's You're sad fine. because they'll want to be involved. If they're asking, it's they want right. to be involved. Sure. Right. But this is where you really should be talking to a different lawyer. It's called an estate and trust lawyer. That lawyer handles setting up your will. There's something called a healthcare surrogate who makes your medical decisions Mm -hmm. if you're unable to. Durable power of attorney. How does your, who handles your money if you are unable to make those decisions for yourself? Something called a pre-need guardianship, kind of saying, hey, this is who I'd like to be the guardian if someone needs to be. There's all these sort of living will. You've heard that term. There's all these sort of, you know, who pulls the plug right? In, in my family, we're a bit klutzy. We like to say, who who's going to trip over the cord? Who's going to trip over the cord? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But when you get married, and then when you get divorced, you should really look at your wills and your estate plan. You should look at all of your life insurance to see who's still the beneficiary. Mm-hmm. 
because in some jurisdictions, you might say, I have no legal obligation to have my life insurance as a, a beneficiary of my former spouse. But if you don't change your beneficiary form on your life insurance, your former spouse might be in for a payday. Wow. So it's really a good idea, as exhausting as it is, and as being tired with the legal process and talking to lawyers, you're going to have all your financial information right there. It's gotten together through everything we've done in the divorce process. It is the perfect time to go see a lawyer about an estate plan. It's the perfect time to go see a financial planner. Because a lawyer can tell you this is what you'll get in a divorce. A lawyer should not be advising you on what this will do for you down the road, on what percentage and put into what stocks or, you know, it's a perfect time to go see your accountant. You have it all laid out and what are the tax implications? So it's all there. You'll be exhausted. You're not going to want to do any of this. Take them one at a time. It usually will not take more than a couple hours to do a basic estate plan with an attorney that knows what they're doing. And you'll have all the information, getting the information together is the hardest part, and it will all be there for you. Sure. So that would be my advice on talking with your lawyer. Not much to talk about with your divorce lawyer, but there's other people out there that I would encourage you to seek their advice and counsel. Well, look at all the time we saved everybody on this very podcast, Seth Nelson. Well done. Keeping it short, as I like to say in court, succinct and persuasive. That's what we're trying to be. That's what we're Don't trying to be. Don't have to drone on and on and on. Aspire to greatness. Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We hope we've given you some guidance here today. It's a, a, not a terribly legal-oriented uh, show, but I think there's a lot to uh, a lot to sort through in a, what could be muddy post-divorce relationships. Uh, we appreciate you downloading and listening to this show. If you haven't yet, uh, definitely check out your podcast app directory. If it's a directory that takes reviews, we would love to see your review uh, for our podcast. If that's Apple Podcasts, scroll down to the bottom. You can say, leave a review. We appreciate all those five-star reviews and nice comments. We'd like to read every single one of them. Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. On behalf of Seth Nelson, we'll catch you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, how to split a toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.